Great. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, let's see uh, who we got here. I think we have a definitely have a quorum for sure. Thank you. Uh, virtually everyone. Excellent. Thank you. Um, welcome to the new year. And uh, hope everyone's doing well and avoiding trouble with the uh, viruses and such. Uh, tonight's meeting will be modest and short, but it's kind of updating things and moving towards talking about things in the next few meetings. Um, I see our, our attendee is Lori, correct? So everybody knows everybody, so let's proceed. Um, I'd like to start with- Did anybody hear from comment. Chuck? Was he sick or? Oh, Chuck, oh, that's right. You well, haven't heard it? Oh, go ahead, David. Yeah, I'll give him a ring. Okay. <laughs> hey, Chuck remembers, I don't know how old he is, but he remembers more than I do, that's for sure. He's the only person in San Pedro older than me. That's all I know. Well, I, I don't know. There are a few people like uh, a certain mother, mother, uh, mother Barbara. Yeah. My mom will be 101 in July. Wow. No way. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And uh -oh. she, uh, she, <laughs> she's a, she's a, um, she's a long-term resident. <laughs> yeah. She, yeah, she was, as my daughter called her a saint. When when she was born, hey. Warren Harding Warren Harding was president. <laughs> wow! And I'm not and I'm not sure Italy was even fully formed yet. No, no. actually, that's funny. She was born the year before what's his butt came to power. Mussolini. Yeah. El Dolce. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so she's seen a lot. Oh yeah, and uh, Miss Bet. Yeah, my, Miss Bet my neighbor just turned one hundred and one in January. Whoa, wow. really? San Pedro San Pedro has a fair share of centenarians. Yeah, pretty impressive. See if some of that rubs off on you, Vic. <laughs> I hope so. There, uh, she and her husband, when he was alive, were original owners too. So, wow, wow. Well, they are the. They are literally the only original owners left in our stretch of houses. The rest of them may still have family of the original owners, but not the original owners themselves. Wow, wow. Well, I said to John Barbera the other day that his mom had outlived Betty White, so that's pretty yeah. amazing. <laughs> and, and I think the genes have rubbed off on some of her kids because she's got one daughter that's, I think, a couple years older than me, something around there who had pancreatic cancer and she's lasted, she's lasted not the right word. She survived, um, I'm guessing at least 10 or 15 years, wow. which is a, almost unheard of with pancreatic cancer. That's right, boy, yeah. she is. And, and she maybe is. longer, but yeah, she, her, her body just really reacted well to the chemo and, you know, she has good days and bad days, but a lot more good days. Well, that's awesome. I must say I have good days and bad days. God bless her. That's great. Hey, that's Vic, great. you want to bring up the uh, agenda? By, by the way, John Barbera, thank you for sending out the agenda. You'll notice I said agenda follows page two so that we didn't have to split the agenda. But yeah. All right. We'll catch it next time. The, the uh, preface to our meetings is so long now. It, uh, we might all, almost just devote a full page and be done with it. Yeah, I'm not sure if we can legally uh, reduce the size of the the font uh, for all the preliminary stuff. Don't want to make it so people can't read it, but maybe we could. But I did. Read, I did reduce it. Oh, okay. All right. Because it was three pages, and I I turned it into two. Well, good. So, oh no, I I just mean the opening part, but I think. Oh. Maybe for future, let's let's make the legalese on the first page and the code 
make that a page unto itself and do the actual agenda on the second page. Maybe this is a short agenda, but sometimes they'll get longer. And here comes our screen share, and there it is. <laughs> so if you go all the way to the bottom, mm -hmm. there we go. Um, thanks. Oh, that's good. You got it. You got it all. All fit in there. Great. Excellent. So I'd like to call for first for public comment on non-agenda items. I um. I had one I was gonna talk about, but darned if I can remember. Hey, Chuck Hart has joined us. Good evening, Chuck, how are you? Unmute thyself. Hello, Chuck. I see a hand up, I don't, uh, I'm not sure I see him, but. Huh. Is Chuck? I, uh, I I just prom I just promoted him. Oh, okay, good, good. Hello, Chuck. <clears throat> Somebody has a TV or radio on in the background. Well, my wife's talking in the next room. <laughs> I'll go shut that. I'll shut that door. Meanwhile, if somebody can raise Chuck, I think he has a public comment, maybe. Chuck, you got anything you want to say for public? I'm still trying to get on the get in get in get in with you guys. You hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's good. I know I had no comment. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing Hearing and see, seeing no hands and hearing no voices, I'll say, let's move on. Thank you. I labeled the next, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I apologize to the group. I should have made the um, section I call housekeeping. That should have been the third, the third agenda item. So my apologies, I guess call it 2A. The next agenda item is is uh, catching up on some of these things we've been talking about. <clears throat> John, I can't remember. Was there was there actually something new on the skate park? No, the only thing is that they've been you know they've been welding up the rails and all of that, and doing massive cleanups. They're keeping the cleaning the the whole parking structure. They're I guess they're there every weekend or even during the week, but they're cleaning it up. Because every time I go by there, it's clean. Um, so they're they're taking ownership. That's great. Yeah, yeah. And I've got a Andy. I guess was out of town, so he hopefully he's back tomorrow, and I'll I'll get the a little bit more of a lowdown on Very what's good. going on. So. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, I had a email exchange with the. Uh, our man at the um, Naval Weapons Station in Seal Beach about the property on North Gaffey, the Defense Fuel Supply Depot. And uh, I will quote, this is, this is the latest from him, which was uh, Friday, I think. Uh, quote, oh, geez, this is a, the apology tour for me, I uh, this printed strangely and cut it off, but basically uh, they're still in negotiations for the property on Gaffey, the Navy and this one potential lessee. And uh, Greg indicates that it appears that it will be no earlier than April for a decision on the need for additional additional environmental review. And if that's the case, we are, quote, we may be looking at spring, maybe spring 2023 for an announcement on the property lease. 
if no additional review, environmental review is deemed required or is needed, and we may have something to say about that, but if, if none is needed, the, a decision could be made as early as this summer, the summer of 2022. But that is the latest word from him. The negotiations continue to be, uh, the information is not available to the public about what the negotiations are, but uh, that's his latest update to us. Um, John, back to you for a minute. Your neighbor who's involved in the youth baseball leagues over on Gaffey, uh, I know he's, he's still concerned because they're not getting any direction about uh, when the lease may, when the lease decision will be made finally, which would allow them to stay. And he's concerned, I believe you said that about having to pack up their well, he's, yeah, he's got two containers out there. Right. And, you know, it's kind of hard if they go to him two weeks before the time's up and go, okay, you got to pack up and get out. Okay. You know, how's he going to move those, those 40, you know, 30 foot bins, you know, those big containers. And he's, you know, he's hoping that he's been calling them, leaving messages for everyone, the girl, the guy, the girl, the guy, but <laughs> no one, no one returns emails or phone, nothing. And, you know, if he knows now he can start on it, he's got a few people that want to buy them that will take them, you know, mm -hmm. for other things. But at this point, he's, uh, you know, he says, it's great. I got six months, but, you know, they can come tomorrow and say, well, we got to do this or, you know, they'll come, yeah. you know, at the, before the end of June and go, by the way, we, you you know, you got to get rid of those containers now. So, well, and, I assume that, am I correct? There's, it's my understanding, and I think it's in the newspaper articles that they are um, continuing to negotiate over ultimate control of that property by cities of Los Angeles and or Lomita, and that uh, it may allow them to stay on a long term basis. But that just hasn't been. It, that's, yeah, the negotiated. They're still not. There's not been no talks. There's no, no meetings, no nothing. And he's still worried about it because, you know, he's put a lot into that place, fixing it up and everything. So, uh, you know, he just doesn't want to get stuck with, you know, caught with his pants down and not be able to, uh, you know, then, you know, what's he do? You know, how's he get rid of them in two weeks, you know? Right. Right. Exactly. You know, that's still bothering him. So. Well, that's, uh, yeah. Well, the, he, he has the attention of the higher ups. So let's uh, let's hope that the negotiations continue. Chuck Hart, okay. I see your hand up, sir. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry, John. What property were we talking about? The uh, nine, uh, eight or nine ball fields on North Gaffey, including Bobby Sox uh, near the police pistol range and the ones farther up, Lomita Little League and um, one of the San Pedro leagues that that use those four or five diamonds closest to five points. So, so is the uh, the fields closest to five points you're talking about? And the two by the police pistol range, and it's our it's our understanding that from the Navy, the, from <laughs> From the the public information office in the Navy, that those those baseball fields are not part of the lease uh, footprint that they are negotiating that the Navy is negotiating right now. So, oh, I, I, if, I, I get that. I just, what, what, what containers are we talking about? The the the, the uh, big containers of equipment on the playing fields. On the in the area towards Gaffey, towards Five Points. Oh, I don't mean at this point. I, I'm not I trying to make. I just never noticed them. I have to go look at them. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. There's they've built up quite a little infrastructure there with fences and snack the deals and scoreboards and and containers full of equipment and stuff. Oh, so it's perfect. just something we're hoping that the momentum that was developed with our 
state and local leaders and federal leaders uh, continues and that deal can be worked out so that the cities of LA and Lomita probably uh, take management possession of that property from the Navy and um, they can operate it in any way they wish. Yeah, no, I got a lot. I just, I just, was, I, I don't know about the container issue. That's all. Okay, thank you. Sorry to beat a dead horse. Let's move on. Thank you. And sorry, and I apologize to any horses that are offended. Uh, the, um, the issue of uh, public transportation coming to San Pedro has been on people's minds for a long time. And it dovetails in a way with uh, uh, an issue brought up by our committee member, John DeMeglio. Hi, John. Uh, some years ago about the thought of extending a bus service from the uh, Park Plaza shopping center at Western and Park Western Drive uh, down to the Target store and, and perhaps even Home Depot, but de definitely to Target uh, to create kind of a, a narrow loop so that people can shop at Park Plaza, ride down to uh, Target and then come back on the bus. It's a great idea. Uh, John did a, a graphic for it, uh, which it, I think was quite illustrative. And I've been racking my brain because about three years ago, I know that we had a, a, an opinion from the city that led me to believe that it was never gonna happen uh, as an individual one-off item. I finally found the source, the person that I had uh, been in contact with and I've emailed him to please respond and get back into a discussion about it. It actually, John's idea does not specifically go through the Department of Transportation, uh, which runs the dash line. It go, has to go through city planning which is a whole other can of worms. Uh, so I will, I will back up three years and just say, well, it's been indicated to us that it's a very difficult long-term project. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, go back and ask again and keep asking. And it certainly could fit in with uh, the motions that we've passed and are moving on uh, requesting that uh, Metro up its game and bring some public transportation closer into San Pedro if, and into San Pedro so that we can really connect with the rest of the city. I see Vic's hand up, Victor. Um, and, and if the initial inquiry that you're referring to was that long ago, it was pre-pandemic, which means uh, they may have more incentive to do it now because people are trying to, I mean, it could go either way. Um, you know, people are trying to, to go places that they may not want to go on their own, but then again, a bus, you get a lot of people crowded together. So it, Vic, it might I be think, worth bringing it up. Yeah. Yes. And, and John, John uh, did a quite elegant uh, little uh, graphic of, of how it would, how it all work. And one of the things we talked about at the time was San, this part of San Pedro is both, on the one hand is aging, <clears throat> here I am. And on the other hand, it, it is inhabited by a lot of uh, teenagers and young adults who are not as interested in driving as they used to be and, uh, for a variety of reasons as we know. So, uh, what you just mentioned and some of the other things we've talked about already certainly would seem to us to skew in favor of Metro, uh, LADOT and the planning department to be more, uh, uh, to look more favorably on the idea. So John, I, I, I wanna continue on this and uh, get back with this guy in the planning department. He has a name that I cannot pronounce, but I've 
I've emailed them and asked them the question. John, I see your hand up. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, not only just our area, the, that plan that I had is from the lower San Pedro coming in on Gaffey. And that includes that bus stop that goes also extends down to Westmont to Home Depot. So it, it would all be connected to that one drawing that I drew. Yes. Uh, people can uh, either come from the lower part of San Pedro up to Target on a bus, uh, extend themselves if they want to go to Home Depot on the same bus, come back to Target, go to Target, get the bus, and also go up to uh, Park Western, uh, up to uh, uh, the shopping center, CVS, um, and all the benefits you have up on Western, uh, basically. And from what I understand is the Del Taco that's being dismantled is uh, from a source from the Ralph's Market cashier saying it's going to be a uh, Panda Express. Panda Express. Oh. That's another benefit for people that, that would benefit from this bus stop also. Excellent, I'm, excellent. I'm not, I'm not a big it's... fan of Taco, but. <laughs> ah, Panda Express is great. Yeah. Uh, I, assume, I assume Panda Express would move from where it is now just up the street into that larger facility. Anyway, thank you, John. I'm glad you've kept after me. And, and I, do, I still have all this. the draw. I still have all the drawings and stuff for that. Good, good. When I hear back from the g gentleman with the name I can't pronounce, I'll uh, see if he can either join us here or or provide a written explanation of what the situation is to add a, tr a trunk line or a, or a, an additional uh, service line. Uh, to the grid. Um, so uh, I, his, his initial response, as I recall, was friendly, but not very uh, useful. So I hope he's, uh, I hope he's more amenable now for the reason uh, Vic cited. And the very good, and the fact that it actually makes very good sense. Uh, thank you, John. Pat Nave, your thank hand you, is thank up. You. Yeah, and you know what, what strikes me about the proposal is, is its potential for really enhancing our sense of community here in Northwest with these, with these particular bus routes. Yeah, because it, it, John's got it focused on, uh, on a key place where people go, where, where you have foot traffic tra and auto traffic and everything else constantly. Um, and, and it just makes, it makes so much sense that it must be doomed, but let's move past the doom part and go to what's possible and see what we can see what we can accomplish. So that was the that was the update on that, and I'll continue. Uh, I'll follow up with the gentleman, and I'll learn his name, so I won't embarrass myself if he joins us in a meeting. Another uh, new item on our uh, civic agenda is the, the life of our city is um, the new rules for disposing of uh, foodstuffs uh, in, in residential trash. As of January 1st, we're all supposed to be separating our food scraps and either composting them or dot, dot, dot. And it's the dot, dot, dot that has me uh, a bit baffled right now. Uh, I, I've looked up online what kind of things they're going to expect us to be re, uh, recycling for compost or whatever. And it's a surprising list. It's, uh, it, it's, it includes things like paper plates. Um, I, I didn't know that, but OK, I guess it's natural stuff. So. Uh, there is no central point at, in the uh, sanitation department website that discusses this. And I've, I've asked uh, 
our go-to guy in the council office, Ryan, to come up with a name or, a, or an office or somebody at the sanitation department that can join us perhaps next month and talk about what the expectation will be for homeowners. Uh, when I was uh, a slip of a lad, probably six or seven years, well, no, I know exactly when it was. In the 19, until the 1950s, and in fact, until 1962, uh, if you lived in the city of LA, you had to separate all your trash, uh, wet trash, dry trash. It was, it was a poor man's recycling effort, but it was effective, but it was annoying to the citizens of LA. They hated having to spend the time, spend the time to separate trash out as the city instructed. And Sam Yorty, who some of you were alive at that when he was first elected, Sam Yorty ran on a major plank of his, uh, his platform was uh, ending the need to separate your trash. He was the guy that made it so you could throw everything into the same can for 50 years, 50 years until we started recycling again. So we're kind of going back a bit, but for a good cause and uh, we hope it will have an impact, but we need to know how it's gonna work. I, I, I hope the city realizes that in asking people to throw, uh, to separate their foodstuffs, that most people use uh, plastic, or I, I, don't, I shouldn't say most, but many people use white, trash can liners now that they tie up and toss in the can. So is the city gonna have a network of uh, a whole new department of people cutting open plastic trash bags and looking for uh, biodegradable uh, food scraps? Uh, I, I find that to be a strange notion. And that's why I'd like to get somebody from sanitation to come talk to us about how this is gonna work. The bottom line for residents is uh, there's a grace period right now but uh, eventually fines will be levied. And my question is, how are they gonna figure out who should be fined? That's, that's just one element of it. So I'm hoping that next month we can have a further discussion and further understanding of this new uh, part of our life that we're facing. John DiMeglio, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I think it's great, but it's going to be hard sorting it. But you know that we have that recycling thing down there by the uh, on on the other side of Gaffey that picks up uh, more electronic stuff. Yes, and if you've seen it, there's a line on the weekends going to that place. I was in that line myself. Yes. Okay. Last there you are. Weekend. I wave to you. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> I think I think if they have something that they want to compost, they should have an area where they do that, where we can drop our stuff off to be compost would would work out just like this deal is here, you know, a big area where we can just drop our compost off, our stuff that goes into that mix there. So but it, to, it's going to be interesting to see how they do it. Thank you. It it will be, and thank you, John. And and uh, composting is uh, one of my understandings is the city will eventually provide composting pails for everyone. So you're right; it'll be interesting. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to introduce our our guest speaker for the evening. Uh, Mr. Pat Nave, uh, the, the sentence is short, presentation by Pat Nave regarding port mitigations. Uh, but that short sentence uh, says a mouthful. Uh, Pat is uh, going to talk to us tonight and I'd leave it to him to explain what it is and what's involved. Um, he's making the same, a similar or same presentation to, uh, did you make it at the port committee Pat? Yeah, Port and uh, Planning and Land Use and Executive Committee have all heard it. Okay. 
Okay, so good. I just, I, I think it's important enough that uh, whatever fora we have to get information out to people or to contribute to the uh, to community understanding, it's important for us to hear this. So uh, if you would go ahead, I'd appreciate it. Okay, can we put up on the, on the screen the, uh, uh, the presentation? I sent it out, um, I don't know, last week sometime. You have somebody there that can can put it up on the screen. Uh, uh, Vic. Uh, yeah, Vic. Vic uh, will get it. Thank you, Vic. So, how about those Rams? Right oh, on. They're, they're pretty good for forty minutes of the game, aren't they? Pat, is it out <laughs> on the supporting docs for this meeting? I don't know if it made it there or not. I, uh, no, it's it, he sent it. He sent it to. You should have sent it. Did you send it to Victor? I sent it to. I think. Uh, I don't remember who sent it to. I think I sent it to uh, you and Dan. I'm not sure. Oh God. Well, apologies okay. to you, Pat. Hang well, on. I, I can. I can talk you through it. Uh, well, let me hang on. Right. If you send it to me, that's the same as the dead the dead letter office. Vic, I don't know if it, it would be in the uh, packet for executive committee for January tenth or not, or for for January third, I guess it was. That would be a it'd be a slightly outdated uh, version. The latest version is dated January twenty first. John, John Barbera, you you and I got that from Pat. Are you able to A, find it, and B, can you get it up on the screen? I'm, I'm doing it right now. Oh, good work. Let's see. Let me see if I can find who I sent it to. Oh, I was, I was one, you're right. Did you get it? Okay. Um, Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, my John Barbera, thank you. Oh, there it is. Great. Thank you. Thanks, John. No problem. You got it. Yeah, this this is one step in kind of about a three month process uh, to gather input from uh, from uh, people, starting with uh, committees and the uh, the Northwest Neighborhood Council. And then when we've got some input and uh, a little more uh, meat to this, then um, the plan is to take it to other neighborhood councils uh, and come up with kind of a, a, um, a proposal that we can make to the port for things that, that as a community we would like them like to see them do. Uh, there's a little bit of background, you know, we all grew up here and so we've kind of gotten used to how things are in, in the in the community and particularly um, things that are caused by what the port does, you know, their, their, their operations, the projects they built and things like that. And uh, so some of these projects that they've, they've done uh, have created uh, impacts. So I wanna kind of divide it in, into three parts here. First is there's a few policies uh, that the, the port could do that would uh, really uh, would do us well in the projects going forward. And then there's a whole bunch of um, things that uh, that we that we that we have to uh, contend with because of the things uh, kind of unintended consequences of past port uh, projects. And they are also matters that we should be concerned with going forward. That's the idea with them. So I can kind of, and at the end, what, what I'm going to ask is for everybody on the committee to think about these things 
and to come up with some uh, additional uh, items that might be on this list. This list, uh, uh, you know, I got one yesterday that uh, isn't on this list, and I'll talk about that one when I get to it here. Uh, the first uh, first section really has to do with policy measures that the port uh, could do. One of the most important ones is, and it has the most impact, is something called statements of overriding considerations. When uh, when somebody comes in and says, hey, I want to build a terminal in the port of Los Angeles, the port says, fine, you got to do an environmental impact report. You have to address significant negative impacts, environmental impacts. And uh, sometimes the applicant can address all of them and usually they cannot. For example, air quality, you know, air emissions, traffic impacts, things like that. And so what they end up doing is having to, sometimes they have to mitigate by buying credits, you know, buying lawnmower emissions in Altadena or, or um, uh, dry cleaning establishments, things like that. But at the end, they end up with a few impacts they can't address they're not feasible to, they're just too costly for them to address. They don't have control of anything outside of their lease premises and so forth. So the, the idea, so they come up with a, a statement, uh, the port, port adopts it, a statement of overriding considerations. And it's usually, uh, usually based on jobs that, uh, yeah, we're gonna suffer increased cancer risks. We're gonna kind of suffer increased traffic. We're gonna, we're gonna suffer this or that. Uh, but, you know, the, the jobs are more important, and so we're going to adopt this statement of overriding considerations. And that's provided for in the law. But, but uh, what, we're, what this, this first um, section talks about is, hey, you know, Port, you're really as much an applicant as APL or Yang Ming or, or Costco or anybody else. You, you, you pair up with these applicants to build these terminals. You share in the costs you share in the uh, the income and the and the uh, you know the tariff charges for dockage and wharfage and things like that. So, port if if the applicant can't address all of the environmental impacts, the negative impacts on their lease premises or from their operations, port you pick up the the deficit and address them someplace else in the port in the local community, so that we don't suffer locally the uh, uh, unaddressed impacts. This probably is going to be, you know, first of all, if they would do it as a policy, that would be great. If not, it probably takes uh, changing one or two sentences in, uh, in the CEQA to get it done. And I think, it, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an issue worth um, addressing. The second policy uh, to address here is one that was adopted by the city council in November of 2021, just a couple months ago. And that was a, a goal of uh, receiving, achieving transition to 100% zero emission for shipping at the, at the port. There's also, uh, and it's not mentioned here, uh, and it probably should be added, there's a, a, I won't call it a treaty because it hasn't been adopted by the, the by the uh, Senate and probably won't be presented to them, but there's an agreement on shipping lanes and so forth uh, to lower the uh, amount of onshore impacts from offshore shipping that should probably be in, in included in this. And we're just saying, okay, for, um, the city council has adopted this as a policy to try for um, a zero emission shipping at the port by 2030. Uh, how about you adopt it too as a Port of Los Angeles, you know, as Board of Harbor Commissioners policy. So that's kind of section one in, in terms of policy. If we go to section two here, you can scroll down the screen a little bit. Whoever, whoever's got control of the mouse. Yeah, mitigations related to past port construction. There's things that the port has done uh, in past that have consequences in the community. Uh, and sometimes they address them. The first one that is listed here, uh, the port builds uh, container terminals. And as you can imagine, because of the weight of containers and because of the, the uh, top loaders and, and other things, 
they build them pretty strong. They they build them to to it used to be. I don't know what the current standard is, but it used to be build them to sixty five thousand pound wheel loads or sixty thousand pound wheel loads. And uh, uh, they put those trucks. You know, the trucks come and go and so forth. And they come on city streets, and uh, the city city streets, particularly in residential areas, are constructed to thirty five thousand pound wheel loads. Um, and so sometimes the streets get beat up pretty bad. The, the photo here uh, is a kind of an older one. I'm not sure that they've repaired it. I'm not sure uh, that they haven't. So, and then if you get around onto Harbor Boulevard down by um, the Vincent Thomas Bridge, you can you can find some some uh, pretty uh, scrungy uh, uh, paving down there too. So. Uh, what we're saying here is, look, you know, when you when you do this, you should probably do so, give a little thought to uh, the, the streets that these trucks are going to go on. And if you recall the the board meeting last last week, when the Gibson Container parking lot was up there, one of the mitigations that were that that you asked for in that document was uh, pave, you know, enhance. Gibson Boulevard. If you're going to put 466 trucks on, on on Gibson, you know, do something to enhance it. Right now, Gibson is in pretty good shape, but when they add those trucks, particularly when they come out or go into the parking lot there, if they build that, streets uh, like this get really chewed up with the turning of the of the wheels of the uh, tractors that are turning onto the streets and so forth. So. Uh, and then the, some of the exits and 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 so forth, and the where, where these trucks are going to go, are going to hit uh, Channel Street, and they're going to hit Gaffey if they're going to go uh, around the, the corner there and go up to the container packing facility up on off of Westmont. So this is one one item. This also relates to comments that we would be making on future EIRs that are submitted for comment. Uh, we would say, hey, you know. One of the mitigations you should do going forward is is to uh, is to be sensitive to this and to to uh, uh, enhance the carrying capacity of the streets. Now they did that with Bridges Boulevard. They knew that Bridges was going to have a lot of truck traffic when they built the Wilmington Waterfront Park and when they when they expanded uh, Trey Pack and Yangming uh, around uh, on Bridges Boulevard. They put fabric under the street and they made it uh, the base of it thicker and the and the the um, paving on top uh, thicker. So that's that's what we would be doing. We would be, we'd be going to them and saying, hey, look, you've got some stuff that you could repair that from past uh, activities that you did, but going forward, you should be sensitive to it too. So that's kind of what number two is about also. When the port builds um, a terminal, as you can well imagine, they don't want power poles sticking up and getting in the way of you know moving containers around and things like that, and um, you know light poles or power poles are ugly anyway. You will never ever see, you know, those models that our architects give you that show these beautiful new uh, facilities they're going to build. And those of you that are in, in planning and land use uh, committee too, you, we see these all the time. But you never see power poles above ground. All of the utilities go underground. Well, they built you know the, the port. Uh, a long time ago, took out Wilmington and San Pedro Road and a hill and constructed John Gibson Boulevard and constructed the container terminal that's, a, that's adjacent there, Yang Ming um, terminal. And when they did it, they put all of their, their utilities underground in the terminal, and then they put the power poles along Gibson Boulevard uh, and, uh, and, then declare, and then made it a, de a designated scenic highway. So um, over the years, if you, if you go down there, you can see it on the power poles that are there. They've added, I call them yard arms. I guess they're crossbars. You can see them there. There's one, I think it's like seven or eight on that one. Uh, I call that the, uh, I had a name for it. It's at the end of Channel Street, or Channel and Gibson Boulevard. Uh, yeah. Me. Yeah. And it's, you know, as, as they add more, uh, facilities in the port and so forth, they add more crossbars, we get more power power lines. So that's also one of the mitigations we asked for in the uh, 
uh, Gibson parking lot uh, comments too. So uh, that's one that uh, is, is a looking, looking back. We've been asking for, for them to underground those poles for a, for a long time. And, uh, you know, they haven't responded. So maybe they'll be more responsive to it if, if the neighborhood councils get together and Wilmington Neighborhood Council joins in too. Maybe they'll sit down and, and listen to it and talk to and maybe schedule some, some remediation for past aspects. There's the, as the aesthetic as impacts uh, is the third one there uh, for the container cranes. Uh, if you come, when you come down to Harbor Freeway, it's probably the most notable. You can really look over there. You can see it looks like a, I don't know, a shipbuilding repair yard or something like that. It looks like a big junkyard with the, and a lot of it has to do with the painting on the, con, on the container cranes. Container cranes get repainted about every three years. Some of these, a lot of the container cranes these days are owned by the terminal operator, but they issue a, a, what's called an accommodation work order to the port and the port paints it for them. And then, then the terminal operator uh, pays for it, for it. But paint is paint and it doesn't matter what color it is, it's gonna cost the same. And so um, the idea here would be to say, hey, look, you know, come up with a color palette that will call, you know, be a little more, um, uh, I don't know what you a little prettier for the for the local neighborhoods, because because uh, you know some other ports, you know Massport, which is the Massachusetts Port Authority, has done that. The painting, the if you scroll down a little bit, you can see this is a massive container moving uh, apparatus that they have in the in Boston, and they they had them painted light blue because when you're down below that thing on roadways and stuff like that. You tend to be looking up at it a little bit and it blends into the sky a bit more. It's quite, uh, I think the, that one may look, yeah, that one shows it a little better. So, um, you know, if, they, if the port, to, port's got the resources certainly to get uh, somebody that knows more about color than I do and design than I do, maybe they can come up with a painting scheme for the, particularly there in the West Basin. You know, the ones for Evergreen, the ones that Anjan has and so forth, that are further away are kind of uh, interesting because of their color schemes and so forth. But the, the ones in the West Basin are pretty much, in my opinion anyway, are kind of, uh, I don't know, rust buckets. Anyway, the next one down is um, the, the railroad quiet zones. Now, I think uh, you've probably heard me on this one before. I've been working on this issue for years and in the last eight years or so I haven't done anything much on it but the uh, the railroad rules uh, are dominant you know predominant they you can't do something if the ICC says um, you know we, we won't let you do it but the ICC alone has established a quiet zone procedure that you can apply for um, uh, areas where the, the railroads, or the railroad engines don't have to blow their horns. Right now, they're required to blow two longs, a short, and a long every time they uh, get within 50 feet of a crossing, um, unless there's an established quiet zone. And there are 58 quiet zones uh, in the state of California. There is one in the county of Los Angeles. It's in in Glendale. The reason we don't have any quiet zones here is because it takes two extra crossing gates at each crossing uh, to uh, establish quiet zone. Right now, as you approach a rail crossing, if you're on a roadway and approaching a track, uh, a gate comes down that prevents you from going forward in your lane, and a gate goes down on the other side, preventing somebody who's coming the other way from crossing. But what the railroads say is, or what ICC says is somebody can go around the first one and then around the second one and you know interfere with rail traffic or maybe cause an accident. So if you have uh, crossing guards on both sides of the track and in both directions, then you can have a quiet zone. There is a, a less costly way of doing it too. And that's a, a sound, uh, something that is a directed sound thing, but as it is now, I think it's 107 or 112 decibels or something like that. That sound carries a long, 
long way. Most of the time when I talk to people locally, they say, oh, it's a, you know, the, the pushing the, the uh, rail tank cars into Rancho. But that's not what we're hearing. We're hearing the stuff on the other side of the uh, freeway at the Gibson off ramp uh, or on around at Trey Pack, uh, Yang Meng uh, at Figaro and on further down too. The sounds carry a long ways. And, you know, I, I talk to people and I, I get complaints from people up on the hill. They can hear them now. I remember Gordon Tuber telling me how his little, his little boy would wake up and with nightmares because of the real horn noise. So anyhow, uh, some years ago, this is a sidelight, the, uh, the port actually started out on making a quiet zone at five intersections over in Wilmington and actually got the funding for them from a grant. But then the, the, a new mayor came in and the administration changed and all the new carbon commissioners came in and they dropped the ball on it and they never proceeded with it. So that's another, that's a fourth one. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, well, th that's, that's one where, port, you know, port engineers are not dumb. They're, very, they're actually very good engineers and they plan these things, but they don't consider the quiet zones or the impact on the neighborhoods. They think about the cost of building a terminal and the rail crossings. And the port owns the rails, by the way, and they own the, the, uh, uh, the rail switching, you know, Harbor, Harbor Belt Line and, and the uh, Pacific Harbor Lines uh, is, is owned by the port. So, uh, Pat, yeah. Pat, yes, sir. It's, a, it's 135 to 150 decibels. Really? Yeah, I looked it up. Thank you. My memory is going, or else they raise the they raise the uh, they raise the sound. Yeah. Some years ago, I had a case, and I had a, a sound engineer who testified in the case, and I asked him to compare the sound of uh, of a of a real engine. He said it's like sitting in front of a brass band playing a John Philip Sousa march without earmuffs. Anyway, uh, industrial uses of vacant lots in the Wilmington area. Uh, this is. Um, some years ago, the port adopted a policy of any, anybody who wanted to sell the port property in the area uh, south of, I think about, it might've been south of Anaheim Street, but there's a whole bunch of lots that they acquired. They wouldn't condemn them and they would get an appraisal and they would pay the appraised price of them. And the port bought a lot of property over in Wilmington area. And then they fenced them off. And then the idea was what they were accumulating property to expand the port northward. And they got so much pushback at that that they, they abandoned the policy, but they still own uh, a, a lot of those lots. And they occasionally use them for other purposes. And I have heard, and I don't know because I want to sit down with them and find out if they are using any of them for container storage in residential areas. But this was a, this is a, uh, something that uh, affects the quality of life, particularly in the, the north, you know, north of the uh, port um, uh, area. So uh, the next one is uh, light pollution. And this one came from, uh, I, came, I think it came from Cynthia. Cynthia Gagne said, hey, you know, uh, light, uh, you know, as, as, as we go more and more to an around the clock port, we're going to have more and more light impact. So most of the time, the new new uh, terminals are designed with downcast light and and so forth. But maybe there's some other additional things they can do um, for uh, you, you know decreasing the amount of glow that we see see that comes from the from the port uh, at night. There's a, a, a there's an additional one that's been suggested. I haven't added in here yet. And that is um, a greening, uh, a greening item, and a and a. Uh, as many of you may recall, a couple of years ago, uh, the city had uh, adopted, uh, and and our neighborhood councils have often suggested these to uh, to developers is to do do greening of their projects in in uh, accordance with the greening plan. That the city—I uh, I don't remember who did it. It was—it wasn't the city. I think it was the city and a, a private, uh, a nonprofit. It might have been uh, um, 
the uh, I forget what they're called, the, the Design Institute or something like that came up with. And so uh, that would be added in here as, as a, an item for the port to include and maybe to go back and do a little remediation and uh, see if there's some things they can do to comply with that green plan. Uh, going forward, what I'm asking everybody on, it, on, on this committee to do, and you know, I, I like being a guest speaker, but I am a member of this committee. I just don't, I don't just don't show up. Um, I, I haven't. Yet, so. Anything that you know, anything that you know, Matt, we lost you. We can't hear you. You're still not coming through, Pat. It sounded like you got a bad uh, bad wire on your mic or... Well, I've got you. Oh, there you me. go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, what I want from you, everybody here, is to come up with additional ideas, things that you've noticed that have, uh, that uh, may be, uh, have been, uh, that we're that we are impacting our community, our neighborhood council area particularly, that um, it should be added to this list, was so that we when we ultimately go to talk to the port, uh, we can say to them, hey, here's some things you need to address, or that we want you to address. Uh, probably uh, at maybe the February meeting, maybe the March meeting, I'm going to ask Christian if we can uh, do this and adopt a. Um, some kind of a, a, a comment document or you know something like what you're seeing now that we can adopt and then take to other neighborhood councils to see if we can get support for it and then after that we would put together a committee uh of people to go sit down uh with a couple of harbor commissioners you know might maybe anthony perosi and diane middleton and maybe cecilia marino um uh, uh or Lucia, um, uh, Marina Linares, uh from Wilmington, and 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 uh, and get the Board of Harbor Commissioners to uh, adopt. Uh, I know that they are looking for something to do as a legacy for them. They they are actually counting down the number of meetings they have left before the new mayor is elected, and they're all replaced. So maybe this would be something that we could get them to do. That's it. Anybody have questions? At some of the mitigations you're talking about like undergrounding utilities does that come out of uh, grant money given to the port or out of the port's budget is this something they have to pony up all the money for or do they have sources for remediation of this kind that's up to them i would think that um i do have some thoughts on it but uh, they would have to go to, since they didn't do it at the outset when they built the street, they could have put them underground. And now, you know, any, 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 anybody who wants to develop something, you go up to Ponte Vista, you, you don't see power poles in there because new developments have to put their, their utilities underground. They could have done it when they built it, the street. They didn't do it. Now it's going to be a retrofit. And um, DWP will try to We'll, uh, we'll charge them money for it. If they can get grant money for it, more power to them. Uh, I have heard from one person that they said that they sure as heck don't want to see um, fixing their past uh, uh, choices by um, and, and then apply it to, to future mitigation for future projects. Um, it's going to be a costly item it, and uh, you know if you believe uh, you know I, i've heard quotes of between 1 million and 5 million for undergrounding the utilities along gibson boulevard i don't know what the truth is i volunteered to do it for five hundred thousand if they give me a backhoe <laughs> uh 
Oh, that's that can do spirit here in San Pedro. I, do. I got up when they were when they were taking the tanks out of Union when Union Oil had tanks down at on 22nd Street. Remember those days? Yes. Yeah, and uh, I got up and I offered. I said, I, I pledge right now a thousand dollars for grass seed if you plant grass there. And Noel Park was sitting in the back of the room. And he says, I pledge another thousand. And a couple more hands went up. You know, just to embarrass the Harbor Commission, the cheap bastards wouldn't put up the money. Eventually, they did. So, oh, wow. you got to give them something to, to do, you know. Right now, it's to, the idea is, is we look, we in the past, when Phil Nicolay was the chair of the port committee, you know, before he got, you know, burnt out and so on, uh, we would put some of these things into environmental comments as proposed mitigation. But we didn't have all the neighborhood councils together doing it where we went in and sat down with them. And that's my hope that, that by doing it that way, maybe we can get some movement on some of these things. You know, painting the container cranes wouldn't cost them a damn dime. And, uh, but, you know, and we put that suggestion in. Uh, it's something they're going to do anyway, right? Yeah. And I'd love to have them fix the damn thing so we don't listen to those horns, man, you know, six times a night. And sometimes they get really, I mean, you want to hear a about the last week or so, man, we've been hearing it like it's like right behind them, you know, right? It's been like, it sounds like it's coming right from behind my house. Well, as, 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 as they increase, increasingly go to an around the clock um, terminal operations, you're going to hear them more and more. They had a big spurt of that about eight or 10 years ago where they were really blowing at two in the morning and four in the morning. And I got so tired of hearing it that it would wake us up. And so I would, I sent an email to Geraldine Matz when she was the executive director. I sent it to her at her home and in her office that the horns were waking me up. I wasn't getting any movement on it. So one day I went and I filed, I kept track of it and I filed 20 claims for a hundred dollars a piece for, for waking, you know, for, for, violating the noise ordinance and for the port not doing anything about the noise. It really pissed them off that I did that. I didn't take them to trial on it, but I let them know I was mad. And so, yep. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly willing to work with them. I'm not, I'm not a radical like Dave Rivera or anything like that. <laughs> I, you, you mentioned the 24 seven uh, work and I, I've lived here 35 years and I've, Went outside oh, maybe a month ago at about 10 o'clock at night, maybe even earlier than that. And it was just plain loud. That was the only word to describe the ambient noise coming from the port. Yeah. I, I confess you could hear the freeway as well, but yeah. uh, if you eliminated the port noise, the freeway would have been a low hum. This was a, a very loud, a disturbance in the force and I wish I had a something to measure the decibels at that point I'd be interested to know what it gets up to there's a program just on just standing in the street there's a program on your computer that you can do that with it can um, you set your computer outside and let it run and then when the, horn, the noise comes in it'll register that I don't know I, I'm not technical I can't do tech stuff right even on your phone you can you can download it on your phone Okay. And you can well, do that. Well, hey, you know, I'm gonna... we can we can certainly I can add that to the North Rail well, I don't know. We can we can I guess probably as as when we sit down with the commissioner's report and stuff like that, I said, look, at least uh, let's go measure again. We, they've done a couple of noise studies and they found high, you know, high levels and so forth. But they didn't do anything about it. Maybe we have to do that again. Maybe maybe they need to have them. Uh, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll figure I'm, out. I'm not. We'll do. I, I, I'm not a radical either, and I, you know, it's the most important business of this community. The work that's done in the port, and various for various reasons, it needs to be done 24/7, probably at least some of the time. But maybe acknowledging I, I i don't want them to stop operations i do want them to acknowledge that it has an impact on us yeah. uh certainly when we're awake and frankly probably when we're asleep and uh 
get them to think about some of the things you're talking about is at least passingly uh, making up for some of the noise. Yeah, for sure. And the other thing is I'm, I'm, I would really resist them trying to pay for any of this out of the uh, public access improvement you know, infrastructure uh, money, the PAIP money that we're fighting with them about, you know. So you, uh, you say it should should come from their general budget. Yeah, it's, look, it's a cost of doing business. It's cost you, of doing you, business. When you build something, you know, if you're going to put a, a dynamite factory next to a res, you know, to a, somebody's house, you, you should should pay for the mitigation, you know, to safeguard it. <laughs> At least for earplugs. You know, I'm gonna, I want to hear from Chuck and I want to hear from John Demiglio about what they think about this program, and maybe Dick too. Gentlemen, any any takers? John DeMaglio, please. Yeah, um, yeah, listening to all this, there's too much in this packet to pass it, uh, to even for them to, you know, we're, we can't even get the bus we can't get a bus line. We can't get a just the train alone done. And, and you're you're talking about way too much stuff here. That it's going to go. It's just a waste of time. That's my 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 uh, reaction to it. Uh, we can piece it apart as far as the uh, the construction of Phillips 66. Those are existing docks. All they're going to do is re redo them so they can get them running again. So. Uh, this is to me, I mean, we wasted 40 minutes here, my opinion. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Chuck, your thoughts? No hands, seeing no other hands raised. Okay. I'll say thank you, Pat. This okay. is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is what the answers are but you're raising good questions and um uh, port's not the mta port makes 50 percent net profit i think they can pay for some of these things maybe they can pay for a bus line to target <laughs> i like that now there's a mitigation anyway with that thank you pat thank you everybody um that's the let me see that's the end of our agenda. Our next meeting will be George Washington's real birthday, February 22nd, uh, the 290th, his 290th birthday. And- um, Hang on, Dan. Yes. Go ahead, Chuck. Oh, Chuck, Unmute, thank Chuck. you. Unmute yourself, Chuck, there you go. At the last meeting, someone was supposed to look into the uh, the pot situation, marijuana store. See what the status was of that. I didn't hear anything on this on this meeting about it. Well, there's nothing that uh, it it's it's not a park. The skate park is is not. It's it's it just belongs to the skate park association. It does not belong to Parks and Rec. So well, there's there's nothing that we can do as of right now park and rec does not has not picked them up it could be a year from now it could be two years who knows but they're just uh their own identity the skate park association it, it is a recreation facility but it is not a park it probably doesn't qualify uh, the def by the definition of what about the green area belt? that uh, green belt um, I suppose pot growers would argue that that's a green belt, but it, so continue, right. we'll continue, Chuck, we'll continue to look into it, but, but we asked the council office specifically about that and uh, it, it doesn't qualify at first blush as uh, a, an area that must be separated by, by the way, it's not 500 feet, it's 750 feet. And that, and and it's certainly certainly within, well within that uh, perimeter, but we'll have to look further into it, because right now it doesn't doesn't qualify as a an excluded space. Not giving up, just uh, 
Yeah, money talks. Place holder. Money talks and bullshit. Yep. Money. Yep. Thank you, Chuck. Seeing no other hands raised, uh, I want to thank you all for being here. We'll follow up on the things we talked about tonight and look forward to seeing you next month and and everybody at the board meeting as well coming up. Thank you. Happy New Year. Go Rams, I guess. <laughs> All Rams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see. And uh, we'll talk to you, uh, talk to you on the street. Thank you all. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, John, for all your help. You got it. I'll, um, and, and of course, Victor. We'll get that going and I'll send it to you later. Just the end by next week. Oh, no. Thank you.